I'll just let you host. Thank you very much, sir, for that kind uh, uh, introduction. And I thank the ASU for this opportunity. So let me start sharing my slides. Yeah, so I hope my, the slides are visible. Yes, yes. Sir. Yeah, okay. So I bring greetings from any hospitals, Bangalore. So let me uh, give you details about the penal processes. So I know uh, there are mainly the residents here. So I will try to keep it simple in the beginning. And then, of course, few advanced aspects. Let me discuss about the penile implants. I have nothing to disclose. So we have gone through all this evaluation, the basic medical management in the previous webinars. So let me now discuss about the surgical option for erectile dysfunction, which is penal prosthesis. Uh, many a times people think that penile prosthesis is something new. Definitely not. Penile processes, the first paper, in fact, was published by uh, Bradley Scott in 1973. This was 20 years even before Viagra came in. So it's been there since many years. So before Viagra came in, the only two options people had were either implant or uh, intracavernosal injections. Uh, so after the Viagra came in, that's when the demand for the penile implants uh, slightly came down. So it's not new. It's been there since many years. And this paper is, was published, I think, in, in 2017 or so. So wherein this paper from the US said that uh, only 23% of the urologists do a penile prosthesis in the United States. And out of these 23% of the urologists, majority of them, nearly 75% of them, they just do four or less implants per year. But definitely this has changed in the last four or five years because of a uh, uh, good number of uh, training programs and good number of uh, andrology fellowship programs. So definitely the numbers have increased. But till 2017, this was the scenario. And there are, on the other, other hand, there are uh, uh, stalwarts like Steve Wilson and uh, uh, Paul Perito, uh, who, uh, uh, who do nearly 400 to 500 uh, penile implants uh, a, a year. And uh, so the United States continues to do the maximum number of uh, penile implants, which is around 80%. Uh, and uh, so my trainings with the penile implants uh, started uh, uh, when I got the ESSM penile implant fellowship, so which I did in Madrid, Spain for three months. And I was very fortunate to get trained under Ignacio Moncada, who, is the, who was in the EAU Andology Guidelines Committee. And also getting involved in uh, cadaveric penile implant workshops also adds on to the expertise. Um, this paper, which we published after we conducted a SASM uh, cadaveric penile implant course in Bangalore, this was in, I think, in November 2019. Subsequently, after the workshop, we presented the results of the workshop as well. Uh, in the EAU guidelines, penile processes continues to be the third line of uh, uh, management for the ED. Whereas AUA guidelines slightly contradicts and, and it says that implant need not always be the last option. In fact, it could be the one of the uh, uh, best options and it need not always be the last one. So you need to give all the options to the patient, let the patient decide what, what he wants. But again, the American guidelines, uh, there's a lot of controversy in this, especially because uh, the uh, the, the, the the American guidelines, uh, basically, uh, there's a lot of uh, insurance coverage that happens in the United States. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so implant surgery is covered under insurance in, in the US, whereas it's not the same uh, in, in, the, in the European countries or in any other countries. So it's easy for a patient to choose a penile implant as against a Viagra tablet, which costs $30. One tablet of Viagra costs around $30. So you calculate that for the next one or two years. So that will definitely exceed the penile implant cost itself. And, and, and on the other hand, implant is free of charge for them. So patients tend to get a penile implant surgery uh, very often in the United States. And again, ICSM also states that uh, an implant should not always be the last option. So in fact, all options should be given to the patient. Let the patient divide, we decide. So in the semi-rigid, we have all these options, the shy implant, uh, tube, tactra, and so on. Um, so so the, the difference between a shy implant and all other semi-rigid implant is that 
Um, let me stop sharing for one minute. Let me show you. I have a different um, uh, good number of implants here. So, um, so this is the uh, Sha implant. Okay. So basically, this is uh, made of a medical grade silicon. Uh, this is the distal end, and uh, this is the uh, proximal end. So if we have this uh, rare tip extenders which we attach at the back end, depending on what the corporal length is. Okay, so this this has no core. The Shy implant has no core, but the biggest advantage is that it has good. It has uh, two additional sleeves, which can be removed based on the diameter of the uh, uh, the the corpora cavernosa. So when you compare it with an another semi rigid implant, for example, this is a a, a tube implant from Promidon, which is Germany and the Argentina based uh, company, and the other one is. Uh, Tactra implant, which is from the Boston Scientific. And I have another one, which is uh, coloplast from uh, the Genesis implant from the coloplast. So all these three are different semi-rigid implants. So I'll just tell you the basic difference between a Sha implant and the, uh, the, semi the tube implant. So the Sha implant, the axial rigidity may not be that great. Whereas you compare with other semi-rigid implant like the tube, like the tube, so this tube implant has a silver core inside. For example, even this Tactra also, this implant also has a nitinol core inside. So these implants which have a central core, they have better axial rigidity. When it comes to Sha implant, the axial rigidity is not very great. Okay, but the biggest advantage with this is that you can play around with the diameter of the corpora because there are additional sleeves here. There are two additional sleeves you can remove uh, depending on the diameter, which cannot be done in, in these implants. So for a beginner, I always say that you should start doing Sha implant. Do five cases, a minimum of five cases, only then move on to any other implants. Because even if you open a wrong size of Sha implant, uh, you can still be able to manage because there are so many things that you can modify in this implant and put it inside. But yes, the results may change, but still uh, you can get over with any complication that arise uh, during the surgery. So this is uh, briefly of, about the different types of implants. Let me also show you about the uh, uh, inflatable implants. So this is a three-piece uh, uh, inflatable AMS 700 implant. So yeah. So these are the two cylinders which will go inside the corpora cavernosa. This is the reservoir which will be placed in and around the bladder. And this is the pump which will go into the scrotum. So, in, so you, when the patient wants an uh, erection, he presses the pump and then the fluid from the reservoir goes into the cylinder. So after the intercourse, then he can press an, another button on the pump. Uh, so he needs to press this and hold it for 3-4 seconds and press the cylinders and then it becomes flaccid. So that's how uh, inflatable penile implant works. So let me get back to my presentation now. Yeah, so I've discussed about this and that's what I showed you different types of implants. And this is the AMS Ambicor which is a two-piece implant which has no reservoir. Uh, especially in cases of when we have very we have done a kidney transplant in such patients, this would be a better option. The two-piece implant would be a better option when compared to a three-piece implant. Again, this is a post-op experience, a post-op picture of an implant patient who has undergone a two-piece implant. So, so this is after one month after the surgery. So, people many a times patients they ask me that whether are these all these tubes are hanging around or outside of the body, definitely not. Everything is very well conceived, uh, concealed inside the body. And again, the three-piece implant, I told you, the it has three components, pump, cylinders, and the reservoir. And most important is any implant you do, you need to ask them, boss, please show me the Cidesco approval. Cidesco is basically the regulatory approval body in India. So all the implants should have these certificates. Only then use this. Otherwise, if you get into some medical legal issue, some some patient has some problems postoperatively, then you may you will be in 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 deep trouble if this has this implant has not gone not received the CDSCO approval. And if some of you want to read uh, more details about the penile implant itself, 
This is one of the very good textbooks uh, uh, released by the ESSM, European Society of Sexual Medicine. And I was very fortunate to become the assistant, assistant editor of, of this textbook as well. And another very book, uh, very, very good penile implant surgery textbook by John Mulhal and Miranda. Again, I was also fortunate to, to write the first chapter for this uh, uh, textbook. So it's very important that uh, you select a, a right patient who really requires a penile implant. I've seen uh, sometimes people who have done penile implant for a premature ejaculation. So understand what the, the problem is. Jildi down ho jata hai doesn't mean that it is erection, erectile dysfunction. It could be even a premature ejaculation also. So understand, take the history properly, understand what the problem is and then decide about the intervention. Always be careful about patients who have OCD syndromes or who always uh, have unrealistic expectations or who have some complex psychiatric disorder. So be a little cautious uh, in these patients and then discuss uh, very well, if possible, uh, involve the partners also that will make the, uh, the further uh, interactions uh, easier. And... Uh, yeah, so we also uh, recently, I think two years back, we published uh, the outcomes of Shy implants. This was actually the first paper, PubMed indexed paper uh, about the Shah penal processes. Uh, this was a case series. Of course, there are a few case reports which were published or some were not PubMed indexed. This was the first paper which was a PubMed indexed and it involved the case series. An interesting thing what we found out is that the majority, around almost 46% of the patients who underwent penal implants they were not, uh, uh, like you see in the Western countries, the most common cause for penile implant surgery uh, is usually after radical prostatectomy or after a radical cystectomy uh, or after a colorectal pelvic surgery. Whereas that is not the scenario in India. In fact, it mostly is that many men with unconsummated marriages uh, due to erectile dysfunction or in the verge of divorce or some of them who have already divorced and then they want to uh, go for a second marriage and then they want to get this uh, erectile dysfunction treated. So we have a younger age group who undergo penile implant surgeries in India who are in, in the range of 35 to 45 years as against 60 to 70 year olds who undergo uh, implant surgeries in the United States or the Euro. So in fact, when we tried to publish this paper, we had a lot of uh, queries from the editors asking that you guys are publishing something which is totally against what they see in, in, in their practice in the Western countries. We said that this is what we see in India and that is what this is what our paper likes to highlight. Again, few basic things when doing a penile implant surgery. Yes, cult urine culture uh, has to be done. And antibiotics. Um, so what the AUA guideline says that one aminoglycoside, which is an amikacin, and any cephalosporin or the vancomycin can be used. I use vancomycin and amikacin in my clinical practice. And uh, of course, there's a lot of debate going on that this antibiotic prophylax this prophylaxis is not good enough. And, and the recommendation now is that uh, antifungals also needs to be added in patients with diabetes. If no diabetes, yes, only amikacin and vancomycin is enough. But if the patient is diabetic and an additional amphotericin uh, or fluconazole should be added is what is the current discussions going on in most of the penile implant conferences. Yes, groin hair removal, this is what I, I do in our hospital. It is always done on the table in the operation theater. And uh, we use this uh, uh, automated razors. And then uh, we do a betadine uh, uh, wash uh, uh, using the uh, scrub. That is a betadine surgical scrub. And then we use the alcohol-blazed uh, chlorexidine solution, which is the current recommendation. So first is the betadine uh, scrub, and then we use the chlorexidine alcohol uh, as the as uh, for the prep. And then also you should have an OT checklist for uh, any any surgery. It is definitely important, but it is more important when you are doing any implants, so that you can reduce the unnecessary in and out movement of the staff, so that everything is kept ready when you start the surgery. And infection rates with the with the current all the precautions that we take is around 1% to 2%. And it significantly increases with the uh, increasing HbA1c level. So once it reaches above 7.5 or 8.5, the infection rate significantly doubles. 
it's it is significantly high so always try to keep the hba1c level below 7.5 that's a good uh, strategy and uh, yeah so always while doing the penile implants try to minimize the skin and the uh, device contact so that the infection rates are reduced and yes most papers say that inflatable implants are definitely better than the semi rigid implants but there are many papers including the one we published and one from uh, jnmc belgam and also there are other papers from many uh, middle east countries saying that good number of patients their patients are happy with a semi rigid implant because inflatables are definitely expensive not every uh, 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 the uh, south asian uh, people can afford it so many of our men are quite happy with the semi rigid implants of course a bit amount of a bit of uh, psychosexual counseling does help uh, in 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 the outcomes of this uh, surgeries so coming to the surgical aspect surgical approach a penoscrotal infrapubic and uh, the subcoronal are the uh, different approaches that is described most people do a penoscrotal approach because this is the approach which most of the urologists are comfortable because uh, many of us or you do a uh, urethral surgery so this is what most of us are comfortable so i i also prefer a penoscrotal approach so th this is in brief of how uh, we do i do a penile implant penoscrotal approach i use a ring retractor in all my cases so you see in the pictures there nobody is holding it nobody is doing a push pull or nothing everything is neat and and uh, the ring retractor definitely helps a lot uh, while doing a penile implant surgery so do a penoscrotal approach and then uh, corporotomy then you uh, again uh, do an antibiotic irrigation wash so the antibiotic irrigation which i use the corporal irrigation uh, i use again the same vancomycin uh, uh, is what i use and then once the implant is placed then you close the uh, vital stay sutures and i always use a coband dressing and then i leave the foley catheter for one or two days so the most important step in a penile implant surgery is deciding the size of the implant so that is the most crucial step so again the for a beginner it may get really confusing uh, but uh, because uh, every implant has has their own strategies of how to decide the uh, size for example when it comes to sharp penile prosthesis uh, it you decide the uh, size of the implant based on stretched penile length so you pull the penis and then measure from the mid glans or the tip of the penis till the uh, pubic bone and that is the length so if the stretched penile length is uh, uh, 10 to 11 cm we use a wh11 sharp penile prosthesis of course the wh11 is the most commonly used uh, penile prosthesis in our indian men uh, so that's how depending on the stretched penile length you decide the sharp penile prosthesis model uh, when it comes to other semi rigid penile implants you decide the size based on a pinch test that you do intraoperatively so pinch test is uh, see most implants semi rigid implants apart from the sha it comes in three sizes usually 9 11 or 13 so they are in millimeter basically they represent the diameter of the implant so uh, so you use a 10 and a 12 size dilator as shown in that picture so you place two dilators so 10 and uh, 12 is how much it's 22 so 22 22 divide is 11 and 11 so you assume that you are placing a 11 size implant on each side on each side and then you measure you you see the what is the uh, uh, gap that you feel in between in between the two cylinders so basically you use your uh, thumb and the index finger to feel what is the gap here if it is too tight if there is no gap at all if it is too tight then it means that the 11 size implant will not be good good for this case so you'll have to downsize and use a nine size implant if there is good amount of space if it is decent space then you can use a 11 size implant uh, whereas if it is there is lot of space in between the index and the uh, thumb finger then it means that you need to use a bigger size implant which is usually the 13 size implant so that's how in in briefly you decide what size of a semi rigid implant you use whereas it comes to inflatable the concept is totally different you decide the length or you do, or you decide the size of an inflatable implant based on the corporal length 
you you make a corporotomy you measure the both the distal and the proximal length then you calculate it and then depending on that you decide the size of an implant and you use a furlough instrument uh, uh, to decide the size the furlough instrument uh, uh, the, only the initially the ams used to produce it uh, uh, so so individually it, it is quite expensive it costs around 2 lakh rupees i know this is a simple instrument yes costs uh, uh, pretty expensive and whereas some companies like uh, like uh, the switzerland ones uh, they usually uh, give it free of cost when you when you, when you are doing a inflatable penile processes so having a furlough is very important so this is how the outer packing of an inflatable uh, implant will be so this is 21 cm means that this is the total length of the uh, corporal length of the penis so for example if the proximal corporal length is uh, 10 uh, and uh, the distal is around uh, uh, so, so for example if the total corporal length is 23 centimeters you use a you open a 21 centimeter uh, inflatable and to this 21 centimeter you will attach a 2 centimeter rare tip extender so it is basically 21 centimeter of implant plus 2 centimeter of rare tip extender which makes into 23 centimeter so if the corporal length is 23 centimeters you open a 21 centimeter inflatable implant again there are a lot of information in this as you see here lgx is different cx is different and cxr is different and again iz means this implant is antibiotic coated which is called as an inhibizone and pre-connected means the uh, the pump and the cylinders are already connected it comes as a pre-connected device and penoscotal means uh, you need to put this implant to a penoscotal approach you cannot use this implant to an infrapubic approach so there are so many things that are there uh, and one requires much expertise when you're doing an inflatable implant so never watch a, a youtube video and put an uh, inflatable implant you will definitely get into trouble if not intraoperatively definitely postoperatively you will have issues semi rigid yes it is not very complex you watch two three surgeries or or attend a live operative workshop and then see if you semi rigid implants being done you should be able to do do them on your own but not an inflatable penile processes Again, when you are doing the uh, uh, corporal dilatations, be careful that, uh, see, the, the proximal corporas are not straight, like in distal corpora. They, 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 they go laterally. So be aware of these uh, uh, curvatures when you are doing a dilatation or uh, when you are introducing a dilator. Otherwise, you will end up doing a, a proximal corporal perforations and the surgery can get complicated. Again, proximally, uh, there will be coning of the corpora so 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 be careful while while dilating the uh, distal corpora as well and the one advantage with the sharp penal processes is that if there is too much of a coning in the distal corpora you can always do a selective sleeve resection just remove uh, only a 2 cm of the uh, outer sleeve so that it fits uh, snugly uh, in this uh, uh, distal this uh, corpora so that's what if you if you place an oversized in implant or if you do an over dilatation this is what is going to happen the implant will extrude and uh, again again uh, salvaging sometimes can become a problem so if you under dilate or put a smaller size implant the reverse can happen that is it's called this is called as a concord effect where you see that there is a floppy glance and again this also can happen if you put an undersized uh, uh, cylinder and in such scenarios what we do is for a floppy glance or a concord effect uh, glance we do something called as a glansopexy where we put a transverse incision and when we fix the corporal bodies at the distal part to the uh, glance tissue so moving on to the reservoir aspect in a in a three piece inflatable aspect so so that was my expression when my mentor gave me uh, to put the reservoir inside. So reservoir is one of the critical steps. So in fact, some of the uh, in, uh, uh, andologists who do an inflatable implant, they first put the reservoir inside instead of, so usually the method to do an inflatable implant is first you put the cylinder, 
and then you put the uh, pump and then you do the reservoir. That's what the most experienced uh, uh, urologists do. But in the beginning phase, uh, you can always put a reservoir because when you're putting a reservoir, if you injure the iliac vessels or you rupture the bladder or something injure the bowel, something goes wrong, then you don't have to open the implant so that you can, because implants are expensive, inflatable implants, the MRP is around 7.5 to 8.5 lakhs. So, so for put a reservoir first and then proceed. If, if it's an uneventful reservoir placement, then you can proceed with the uh, placement of the cylinder and the pump. Because reservoir comes in a separate pack, pump and the cylinder comes in a separate pack. So in the initial phase, always use a separate incision, make a suprapubic incision separately to put the reservoir. But, but the most experienced andrologists, they put both reservoir, pump, and also the, the cylinders through a single penoscrotal incision. In your beginning phase, put a second additional incision, put a counter incision in the suprapubic to put the reservoir separately. Again, the, the, the old traditional method of placing a, a reservoir was uh, below the transverse salis fascia. If you see this lateral view picture, uh, it used to be below the transverse salis fascia, but now the recent technique, many of them are modifying it to place it in an ectopic location, which is under the rectus muscle and but above the fascia transverse salis. This is to avoid injury to the bladder because uh, most of these patients who undergo implants in the Western countries are, like I said, post radical uh, uh, prostatectomy or radical cystectomy, where that vesicle space in and around the pre-vesicle space is, is already gone. So the mechanical survival of these inflatable implants is around 80% at 10 years and it's around 70% at 15 years. Uh, so you see this is the data here. So which means that uh, uh, around if you do 100 implants, 80 of them continue to work at 10 years and at 15 years, 70 will continue to work. Um, you can also do an along with the implant, or yes, if there's in the case of Peyronie's disease, uh, you can also do a simultaneous implant plus grafting. Sometimes doing a, just an incision, plaque incision itself will correct the curvature. You don't have to always put a graft if the defect is less than two centimeters. Again, while doing this simultaneous implant and grafting, you need to be very careful you need to elevate the neurovascular bundle very carefully. That's the most critical step uh, when doing the grafting procedure. So the, the, the David Ralph group from the uh, UK, from the London, uh, they are the staunch uh, promo, I mean, the, the uh, promoters of putting an early penile prosthesis in a priapism patient. Because when patients with priapism, they present very late, most of them, they present very late. At least they come after two, three days and so on. By then, the, the corporal tissue is already dead. Whatever procedures you do, it's only a temporary thing. Eventually, most of them will develop erectile dysfunction over the next three to six months. So early penile implant is a good strategy because after six months post priapism, it's, there will be significant corporal fibrosis. Putting an implant will become very difficult. So next, coming on to the few of the challenges, intraoperatively, when you're in the initial phase of the dissection, you're dissecting the, the spongiosal, uh, spongiosa, and then you're trying to dissect the plane or the corpora cavernosa to make a corporotomy. Suppose if you injure the urethra, you don't have to abandon the surgery because you have not yet done a corporotomy here. So in the initial dissection, if the urethra gets injured, you can always repair it. A uh, fully catheter will anyways be there and then continue with uh, placing an implant. So difficulty during corporal dilatation can happen if you're in a long, wrong surgical plane or if there is a, a significant fibrosis. The solution to this is, of course, extend the corporotomy uh, incision so that you'll be able to uh, uh, directly view it and then uh, whatever uh, you can adequately uh, guide the dilator in the right uh, direction. Again, proximal corporal perforations can happen if, if you're not aware of the lateral curvatures of the crura or if there is any significant fibrosis. So for this, a rare tip extender sling technique is described. And if the urethral perforation happens during the corporal dilatation, this is the time you need to abort the case. You shouldn't be uh, putting an implant. If 
Opposite side corporoid, if you have already put an implant, you can still leave it there. But the side of the urethral injury, the side where the corpora, the implant has, the dilator has gone through this, for example, right corpora and then entered into the urethra, you cannot put an implant on the right side. And again, there is a, a concept called as a crossover. So if you see in this image, so sometimes you will have difficulty, you would have done a need dilatation, but uh, when after you put an implant, uh, you will find some difficulty. So in that case, keep uh, this uh, thing that it could be a crossover, meaning that both the cylinders distally, they may be uh, in the right uh, position, but proximally they would have gone into only one, uh, one corpora. So again, take it out and then uh, and then uh, you will have to readjust it. So crossovers are common, can be seen. And uh, even the distal corpora, distal crossovers are also seen. So you need to be uh, aware of such a thing can happen only then you'll be able to pick up and correct it. Okay, so if there is a bladder injury, uh, so, so you usually put the reservoirs either through the left inguinal uh, superficial ring or the right inguinal superficial ring. So if you injure on the left side, you can always put it on the opposite side. So I have seen even in a, a live operative workshops, uh, one of the workshops where uh, while the while placing a reservoir, there was an iliac vessel injury. So even the experts also can end up with complications, especially in a case of post-radical prostatectomy or a post-radical cystectomy where you're trying to put a, a reservoir. So that's why the, the, the recently many andologists have moved in to put the reservoirs in the ectopic location. That is above the facial transversalis, just I mean in the plane, just below the rectus abdominis. So postoperatively infection, yes, the rates have significantly reduced with the advent of antibiotics and the number of precautions that we take uh, intraoperatively also. Um, so Mulcahy uh, salvage protocol is is the one which is very commonly described in in most of the publications. So initially the concept was implant is infected, just remove it. But now the concepts have changed. So the salvage is what is the term that is in the vogue now, which means that you take the implant out, you give a thorough antibiotic wash, and then uh, if an inflatable implant was there, it's got infected, then you can take out, give a thorough wash, and then put him on high antibiotics, and then you can put a malleable implant at the same time. Because the, the reason is once an infection has happened, you take out the implant and you try to come back after six months and try to put an implant, it's a complete mess. So you will end up with a lot of complications, glands perforations, urethral perforations, all these can happen. So that's why the salvage concept has come in and, and there are many papers coming in that by doing a salvage procedures, things are quite good and the infections rates are also less. So again, glands ischemia is a known entity. So usually after the implant, uh, 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 this glands ischemia can happen. So when a patient after the penile implant surgery complains of unusual significant pain, first thing that you should inform your residents or whoever is there to go and see the glands first. If it is dusky or turning into black, the immediate thing is you need to take him immediately to the operation theater and the processes has to be removed. So if you see this diagram here, this is very commonly seen in patients who have undergone a urethroplasty and then you have done a penile implant in them. Because during a urethroplasty, many a times the bulbourethral artery gets injured or we cut it during the urethroplasty and all the blood supply is on, on, on the dorsal aspect. So and if you put a very tight implant, the dorsal blood supply also can get compromised and then it can result in uh, glands ischemia. And also, if you have done a simultaneous neurovascular bundle elevation, if it has not gone right, in that scenario also, it can lead to uh, glands ischemia. Again, one of the largest series, which is published by, again, Wilson is around, I think, around 30 cases, where uh, most of them did well uh, when they did an immediate uh, explantation of the penile processes. So mechanical failures I already uh, uh, discussed and uh, hematoma is something which uh, you should always avoid. So apply the drain. Again, uh, usual uh, the teaching is that drains will increase the infection rates, but definitely not. 
many uh, implant uh, andrologists use a drain in western countries so drain is an important thing to prevent hematomas compression good compression bandage and and when we do an inflatable implants we always leave the device inflated by nearly 50 to 60% so this is what i use i use coban dressing uh, this is basically from the 3m which is easily available so anybody doing a penile implants should use this coban dressing it, this is not the, the, the dressing which the orthopedic surgeons use. This is a different uh, 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 dressing uh, which, has, which, which will not leave any marks on the patient. And I think all of you should try this Coban dressing if you are doing any penile implants. And again, small drains, 100 ml drains are available. And most importantly, any patient who has undergone an implant surgery, you should give them an implant card. Uh, each uh, implant box has this card do not forget to give this because see many of them they travel in flights nowadays and you see the semi-rigid implants they have this uh, uh, metallic course inside so you never know they may be you know uh, uh, they of course they will go through the security checks and and sometimes can become a problem so so make the, sure that you give these implant cards and tell them that anytime you travel to any sensitive places or when you're going uh, for a flight in a flight so make sure you carry these implant cards in in, in your wallets so again so again uh, sometimes people ask me that how many implants do i do uh, what i tell them that uh, 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 doing high number of implants is 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 doesn't determine a good andrologist this is what mulhal told me that uh, it's not the number of implants you do what matters is how many men you can prevent from getting an implant by exploring all the non-surgical options before you you put an implant because the implant is always the last option because once you put an implant there is a complication you have to remove it then he will lose his erection for life so keep implant as an always as a last option try all other options beforehand and then uh, move on to the implants as a la last option so that's the end of my talk I hope uh, uh, people benefited from this talk. I will be happy to take questions. I did not specifically do any uh, uh, the test uh, uh, so that I thought, let me spend more time discussing. I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pramod. It was a very wonderful talk. You highlighted many practical points which are not given in the books. That was, I think, very useful. So any questions, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask uh, Dr. Pramod. Well, I have a few questions. <clears throat> yes. um, so you, somebody wants to start uh, doing parallel process, you advise them to start with a um, this in the malleable and then go for a two piece or three piece? So yes, sir, again, uh, malleable, there are different types. It will get confusing for many of the first time implanters. So always use a shy implant because suppose if you have opened a wrong length size implant, you can always cut it because there is no core inside. It is quite flexible and, and you can easily cut at whatever level you want. And, and if you feel the diameter, you have, I mean, if you're wrong, if you have not judged the diameter properly, you can always remove the excess sleeves and then you can push it inside. So you will be able to get over because once you open an implant, it is done. I mean, you will be charged, for example, a shy implant will cost around 20, 25,000 rupees, whereas another, the imported semi-rigid implant will cost at least 1.5 lakhs is the MRP. So always open a right size implant. That's why I always mention that deciding the size of an implant is the most critical step in a penile implant. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so beginner, always do five shy implants, only then move on to any other implants. Never attempt semi-rigid, any other semi-rigid implants also. Attempt only the Shah. Do five Shah implants first. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So uh, Pramod, uh, Dr. Ginny here. Yeah, Dr. Hi, sir. Uh, Pramod, uh, between different implants in the semi-rigid and uh, uh, between uh, Cypher and uh, AMS, uh, do you prefer any, any one uh, specifically because of a particular reason? So you, you said between Zephyr and uh, the so AMS, basically the, the Boston Scientific is the, I mean, uh, the AMS, the old AMS now. So what they have is this Tactra implant. Uh, I mean, the Zephyr and Tactra, uh, so the Zephyr and this tube are almost the same. So there is this medical grade silicon and this inner silver core, which is almost the same. But Tactra, 
there is some issue with the tractor. For example, I'll I hope you're able to see the video, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I can yeah. see. Yeah. So the implant. So this is the uh, uh, the Boston Scientific Tractor semi rigid implant. So when I bend it, it, it the, the memory is not very great when compared to an another semi rigid, rigid implant like uh, like a tube implant or a Zephyr. So there is some issue with the Boston Scientific Tactra implant when it comes to the memory. And also there was a paper where they described that there's a snake-like deformity which is happening in patients who have undergone this SHA implant. So definitely there is some issue uh, with, with the Tactra implant. Again, I, like I said, I have no any financial disclosures, nothing to disclose. So I feel the Zephyr and the tube implant gives a good amount of memory. It helps the patients to conceive, conceal uh, better in the inner wear. Mm -hmm. okay. And between the inflatable, so uh, inflatable Cypher and AMS? Sir, Zephyr, I mean, sir, I, I personally, I always go with the AMS because AMS is there since many years. They have done a lot of R&D and, and it's been there since many years. So I always do this. Of course, yes, AMS is quite expensive. It's around one, one lakh expensive. But uh, I always prefer an AMS inflatable implants. I do not want to take a chance in this because long-term studies with the Zephyr is not available because Zephyr just came into the market. This is a Switzerland-based company. Just came in, I think, just four or five years back. They're still new in the market, sir. So we do not know the long-term outcomes. But, but definitely Zephyr implant is good in when you're doing a neophallus reconstruction because they have a, a, a dedicated implant for neophallus, which is for example, for the female to male transgender surgeries, they have a, a different uh, inflatable implant where there is only one cylinder. Normally in all the inflatables, there are two cylinders. Uh, whereas in Zephyr, they have a special implant where there is only one cylinder which can be implanted uh, in, in gender reassignment surgeries. So in the in the AMS between AMS and Sapphire, they mentioned that uh, actually uh, they, they have got a ready-made uh, 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 this one like uh, uh, now reservoir. So is it very important in our practice? Uh, so, so reservoir again, there are different uh, options available in the AMS also. Uh, again, this is a concealed reservoir. Other one is a, spe a, spe a spherical reservoir. It doesn't make much of a difference, sir. I think that shouldn't be nowadays. Okay, that is uh, in the in the uh, the same swinger, I think. Sorry. Yeah, so yeah, sir. Think, yeah. yeah, yeah. Correct, sir. Okay. Prabhu, there's one question from I don't know. They have not specified their name. It is shown. I think you have to mention your name when you ask a question. In a semi-rigid implant, will the phallus always be semi-rigid? Yes, obviously it is true. So yeah, so again, we need to tell them that the penis will be erect all the time, yes. but you will be able to bend and conceal in the inner bear. So that's why use an implant which has a better concealability, better uh, yes. malleability, and which has a good memory. Yes, yes. Uh, how often do we replace the fluid in the reservoir of AMS? It's just one-time placement, sir. Very rarely, maybe, I mean, I have just seen one case where required reservoir, I mean, uh, there was some leak and then it has to be refilled. That was during my fellowship, I had seen that. Remember, one more question. If you yeah. have got somebody like after radical prostate, you have got a incontinence and erectile dysfunction. Uh, if you are going for a combined treatment, uh, will you stage the treatment or will you go for a combined treatment? If you are going for a combined treatment, will you go for a inflatable or a rigid one for implant? Yes, sir. So I work with Monkada, sir. So he does combined, he calls it, a, they call it as AMS 1500. So which means AMS 700 is the inflatable penile implant. AMS 800 is the artificial sphincter. So they call it as AMS 1500. And they put both through a single perineal incision. So he used to do a lot of these, but again, the suggestion is that better not to do both at one time, because if one gets into trouble or if one gets infected, then we need to change both of them. So to be on a safer side, unless we become really experts, we are doing large volumes. It is always to do staged. Correct. If you are going in the stage one, if there's any issue with the tissue planes or dissection, 
Yes, sir. So artificial sphincter, you put it through the perineal root and then uh, inflatable implant, we can put through the penoscrotal approach, sir. Better to go in two different planes. If you're doing at same time, single perineal approach, two different times, two different uh, planes would be better. Thank you. Thanks. And um, Pramod, once you place the prosthesis, when do you advise the patients to start using it? So usually six weeks is what the textbooks say, but I usually tell two months, sir, extra two weeks, because they will have some pain. Mm -hmm. And I've seen patients who have had sex even after two weeks after the implant surgery. That is a different story. Yeah, but I usually tell two months. Two months. Okay. Yeah. And the capsule formation will take around three months to form inside. That is when they will be completely out of pain. Till then, they will have some amount of pain. Okay. And uh, have you assessed the satisfaction with uh, uh, two piece, three piece, and uh, if uh, malleable semi rigid? Yes, yeah, so that's what we had published in the Shy implant paper also, which we published two years back. So definitely, what all the the data says is that with the inflatable implants, mm -hmm. the patient satisfaction is around ninety five percent. Okay. Whereas with malleables, it is around eighty percent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Partner satisfaction with inflatable, the wife, the partner satisfaction with inflatable is again around 90%. Okay. But as it comes to semi-rigid, it's around 50 to 60% is what the all the Western papers say. Okay. Mm -hmm. But but whatever the I mean, whatever the patients that we see in India, most of them are they're okay, so they're they're happy. Because, like I said, the issue in India is the 35 to 45 year old couples who are trying to save their marriages. It's a totally different population that we see here in India. Yes, yes. So the couples are usually okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So suppose there's a pump failure in a three piece, a two piece. Can we just replace only the pump? Yes, sir. Only the pumps are, are available. Like I showed you that one of the pictures where I showed you the external coverage of that uh, AMS 700 implant. So that comes as a pre-connected. So there are other packages which come as without connection. So the pump also comes separately. So we can only replace the pump also. Okay, thank you. And uh, there's a question from Dr. Chandra Prakar. What investigations to you? Put? I think this was covered in earlier class. Potency certificate. I think you can watch uh, previous videos about evaluation of erectile dysfunction. Post-op, any specific medications apart from antibiotics with anti-inflammatory anti drugs? Sir, all guidelines. I mean, Monkada, I work with Monkada, he's in the AE andology guidelines. Mm -hmm. So guidelines say no post-op antibiotics, but everybody gives antibiotics for nearly one week or 10 days, oral antibiotics. Usually it is amoxicillin tablets or uh, uh, or uh, any uh, cephalosporins. Okay. So, so this thing and avoid intercourse for nearly one and a half to two months. And then the cycling is, is one concern in, in the inflatable implants. Usually it is around 50 to 60% kept inflated immediately after the surgery. We call them at two weeks and then depending on the patient's pain, we try to cycle that. And if the patient says he's still having too much pain, then we, again, we push it to, we tell that let's do it after uh, two more weeks. Mm -hmm. Again, we usually do the full cycling by, usually by one, one, one and a half month. And the patients usually start doing their cycling on their own by two months. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. Mm, any other question from anybody? You can unmute yourself and ask. You can learn so many practical points from Dr. Pramod, which we may not find in the books. Um, Dr. Kannan sir is there. Kannan sir, you're there? Krishna Sam Kannan sir? Sir, Ginil, sir, uh, the, in all the Western countries, the Euro-Oncology department drives the Andology department, sir. They, they are the most, uh, I mean, the suppliers for the Andology department. <laughs> so that you can join me. <laughs> yes, Even with the robotic surgery, nervous pairing robotic surgery also? No, sir, whatever robot comes, I mean, uh, I mean because I, I, I was in MSKCC also in New York. I was there for one month. Hmm. So the, the, the way they work in MSKCC is that Every patient is given an option for uh, the sexual health consultation. Like anybody who is undergoing a prostate surgery or a colorectal surgery uh, or a uh, radical um, cystectomy, they give an option that if you want, you can consult the andologist. So if they tell 10 patients, uh, uh, 10 patients, nine of them come for andology consultations. Oh. 
whether they're getting an implant is a different thing, but nine of them, they come, they, they discuss about the sexual health issues. Even men at 80, 90 years of age also come for the discussion on the sexual health. So the oldest patient I have done an implant, of course, again, it was during my fellowship was in a 92 year old guy who underwent a penile implant because he was, he was still fit at 92 years. He played tennis till the age of 80 years. And now we had a 45 year old girlfriend. So yeah, so there, there was a demand. So, I mean, he got the implant done. Of course, so, the scenario is different in India. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. But but most Western countries, the urology department feeds the patients to andrology department. Correct. And there's a question from Dr. Mukulesh Ramesh Babu. Do we have special dilators for dilating or we can use the Hegart's dilators? Sir, I mean, unless if, if you're not doing a Peroni's disease uh, case, even a simple Hegart dilator should be enough. Okay. Uh, sometimes if you're doing high volume Peroni's disease cases, then you may have to purchase the cavernotomes. Yeah. But 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 with the scissors itself, if, if we, we will be able to uh, sometimes uh, excise the uh, corporal fibrosis. So Hagar dialectus is 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 okay. So it should be good enough. Okay. Regarding uh, Surya's uh, discussion about uh, robot and the impotence, okay. actually majority of uh, what we see is nerve preservation is both possible in the open and uh, uh, robot, but the learning curve is different. That's all. Always, majority of the patient uh, outcome comes according to the disease status. And what we get in India is majority are uh, high risk patients. So naturally, the importance possibility is far higher than what is there in the literature. Like uh, when uh, we analyze our data, we found that around 90% of our patients are uh, high risk patients. Yes. So naturally, nerve preservation will be very poor. That's one. But the other way around in the radiation also, we are giving two years of uh, androgen deprivation followed by radiation. And after androgen deprivation, at least one or two years, they won't be having um, uh, erection. So even if they are recovering, finally the outcome comes almost similar. So erectile dysfunction is an issue in uh, CA prostate, uh, both in the surgery side and the radiation side. Thank, thank you for your comment, sir. Uh, I mean, uh, John Mulal, where I worked with him for a month, sir. So he is a staunch promoter of this penile rehabilitation after uh, radical prostatectomy and radical cystectomy, where he puts all patients uh, on 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 uh, PD fine inhibitors, and he makes that uh, make sure that all patients they get some erections, even though if they're not sexually active, also. He puts them on a PD fine inhibitor so that their corporal uh, penile corporal tissue is preserved, so that uh, their their erectile function gradually recovers over a period of time. I also put on uh, PD fine inhibitors uh, routinely, mm -hmm. like uh, tenlafil uh, five milligram followed by twenty milligram SOS routinely for at least one year. By the time I counsel them about uh, uh, options other than this one, like injectables and all these things uh, in the first year. And by first year end, they decide whether they want something or not. So accordingly, I decide usually. Up to one year, I just give them a you know, breathing time just to uh, think if they are not very keen uh, before that. Okay. So what they do at MSKC is that uh, they, they wait for three months. They put them on PD fine inhibitors, wait for three months. If a person is not getting good erections, then John Mulal he puts them on intracavernosal injections. Even if you're not sexually active, at least once a week, take an injection so that your corporal tissues are preserved. So that's his uh, way of doing it there, sir. No, my question around is, somebody, a few of the people are telling that repeat injection can affect your implant surgery. Is it right? So again, sir, what happens in India is uh, people use only papaverin injections. Papaverin is definitely, it's, it's quite uh, acidotic. So that causes a lot of corporal fibrosis. So papaverin alone should not be used. Either use alprostadil or use papaverin plus chlorpromazin. So I, my form of ICI, what I do is I use only alprostadil, which is the only FDA approved drug. What Dr. Rupin Shah sir and, and Vinit Malhotra, what they all do is they use a papaverin plus chlorpromazin. So you need to use this. You cannot just use papaverin. If they're doing this properly, then if they're using these compositions, then, then it's okay. So the, the, the corporal fibrosis rates are not very high. Okay. So alprostadil, uh, you prepare yourself or is it available? In the yes, market? sir. It, it comes as a 500 micrograms. One vial comes as a 500 micrograms. 
I dilute it and I have kept it in the refrigerator in the hospital pharmacy, sir. So I dispense 20 micrograms in one insulin syringe. But that is expensive compared to chlorpromacy. Right? Sir, yes, sir. Uh, sir, 500 micro, yes, expensive. I mean, one, 20 micrograms, we charge 250 rupees, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, so yeah, they are not using it daily, so it's not easy. <laughs> uh, there's one question, Dr. Pramod. Andrology fellowships in USA, do we need to clear the assembly? Um, sir, again, actually, I had a slide. Um, so, sir, I, I did my male infertility fellowship in, in Chicago, University of Illinois at Chicago. Okay. So, so there, what happened is, I initially went for two weeks as an observer. Okay. It was in 2018. And then next year, he, he the professor there took me as a, uh, uh, as a visiting professor. Mm -hmm. uh, on the paper, I went as a visiting professor, but I, I mean... Work-wise, I went as a fellow. So the professor should write a strong letter of recommendation to the medical council there. Only then they will approve. So this limited license, I had got a visiting physician permit for six months. So that with that license, I cannot do any private practice. I should operate only under the supervision of an academic professor in an university. I cannot work in any private clinic. I cannot do any surgery in a private clinic. So those are the uh, some of the restrictions they have. But again, you need to know that professor, some re high recommendations, only then they will go to that extent of writing a letter of recommendation. Okay. But some programs are very clear that they want a USMLE cleared candidate itself. But but I, 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 I was there in Chicago for four months without USMLE, but with a valid physician permit, I, I was able to operate for four months in the US, in a university. That's great. That's great. Fine. I think uh, there are no more questions. I think we have come to the end of this. Uh, one thing is that, sir, for, for andrology fellowship, hmm. you don't have to spend one year at, at a place. For euro oncology, definitely a lot of surgical skills are required. You need to spend one year or, a, or a two years' time. Hmm. For andrology, like what I did is three months I was in Spain, three months I was in Belgrade for gender reassignment surgeries. Mm -hmm. And then four months in in in, uh, in in Chicago, and then one month with John Mulal in MSKCC. Mm -hmm. So I picked up few very few few things at at few at 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 every center. So you don't have to be at one place uh, for in in andology. I meant sir. Mm -hmm. So if you spend two three dedicated time high volume center. That that's good enough to pick up andology skills. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Pramod. Thank you very much, Dr. Ginil. Yes, Surya. Yeah. Concluding remarks, President-elect. No, it was uh, exceptionally good talk, uh, exactly. and uh, you Very came good. out with a lot of point, points, yes. which is practically useful. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for uh, coming for this uh, uh, venture yes. and uh, enlightening us with your uh, talk. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pramod, for giving a second talk in uh, ASU Smart Class. So on behalf of the ASU Council and all the members, I really profusely thank you for sharing your knowledge. And in future also, we'll be maybe inviting you for any talks related to andrology in fertility. Thank you, sir. It's my privilege, sir, to be associated with ASU. And, and I'll be seeing you all in the ASU Trivandrum, sir. I've already done the registration. Oh, great. Okay, sir. Okay. So thank, thank you. you Thank you. The talk is recorded and it will be very soon uploaded to our YouTube channel. So I want all of you to subscribe to the channel and see the updates. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Thank you all. Good night.